Gospel according to Mark. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter number 2. Gospel according to Mark, chapter number 2. And I appreciate these folks uh, sharing their burden with us. And I appreciate folks who are wanting to start churches. I know when the Lord led us to Madison, Wisconsin at that time, uh, we would have to plant 500 churches a year just to maintain the population growth of the U.S. 500 churches a year. That doesn't include the 1,500 churches a year that close their doors. There's a great need in America. America has become the third largest mission field in the world. And we are growing by leaps and bounds in every way. But I believe we're becoming less and less of what God wants us to be as a nation. And we need light in this world. We need light in this country. And it begins in our churches. Mark chapter number 2. I want to make a statement after I read this morning. So I want you to have a pen in hand ready to write some things down. Mark chapter number 2. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Mark chapter number 2, verse number 1. And again he entered into Capernaum. After some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. Verse number 2 says, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing the... Bringing, they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? And who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. We never saw it on this fashion. I want you to go back to verse number 5, where we'll take our text this morning, where the Bible says, And when Jesus saw, when Jesus saw, Saul. The Bible says in this passage of Scripture, and we're going to delve into this message here in just a moment, but the Bible illustrates for us these four men who carry this one that is sick, and the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. Can we honestly say, as, as we heard last night preached so well, that every one of us uh, need to often remind ourselves, or we should honestly say that every one of us need to remind ourselves often to have the faith in God that God desires that we have. Amen. We, we see these men and they're carrying this one that's sick, and the Bible says that Jesus saw, but I find, interestingly enough, later on in the passage, in verse number 8, that in verse number 7, when... Why doth this man speak blasphemies? And who can forgive sins but God, those that are sitting there? The Bible says in verse number 8, And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, verse number 8, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Not only did Jesus see the actions of the men who brought this one that was sick to Jesus, but he saw the heart of those that doubted who he was. And while we often worry about what Jesus sees on the outside, understand that God also sees what's on the inside. 
While we often are more concerned about what we portray to those that are around us, Christ is more concerned with who we are. The Bible says that Jesus not only saw the actions of the men, but he also saw the hearts of those that were sitting in the room. And this morning, Jesus sees your heart. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what the intents and the motives and the purpose in your life is. God knows it all. And none of us can fool the Lord. The Bible tells us here that Jesus saw their heart. Jesus saw what was on the inside Many times, as I said already, we become more consumed and more concerned with what people see about us and what people know about us in the world in which we live. I said just a moment, uh, just a few sermons ago, it used to be a while before we received information about things that had happened around the world. But in today's world of social media and technology, we can know in an instant what's going on anywhere in the world. The truth of the matter is, is we portray oftentimes in this virtual world that we like to live in, the only thing we want people to see are the good parts about us. And the only thing that we want to portray is what we think people want to recognize. And the fact of the matter is this, we have become so consumed with what the world thinks and we become less concerned with what God knows about us. The Bible says in Jesus saw their hearts. Jesus saw their hearts. I want you to write something down. God loves us where we are. God loves us where we are. No matter where you are in life, God loves you. No matter what circumstance you're in, no matter what trial you're going through, no matter what struggle you're facing, no matter how difficult the circumstance you're involved in, God loves you where you are. But God loves you too much to leave you there. God loves you where you are, but he loves you too much to leave you there. We find a man here in, in the book of Mark, and you'll also find this miracle recorded in the book of Luke as well, but we find in the book of Mark a man here, if you would please look back, back with me, if you would please at this passage in verse number 3. And they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Here's a man who was sick, unable to carry himself, unable to care for himself unable to accomplish within himself what needed to be accomplished to get him help. He didn't even have the ability, Ricky, to go to the doctor. He couldn't even get up and drive himself anywhere. He had no ability to care for himself. But do you understand that God loved that man? Amen. Do you understand that no matter how sick and dirty and unclean we are, that God loves us? But he loves us too much to leave us there. And sometimes God places instruments in our life. Sometimes God places tools. Sometimes God places people in our life to help get us to where God wants us to be. God loves us, but he loves us, friend, too much to leave us there. When I says, well, God loves me and I love the Lord, I'm certain of that. As a matter of fact, if we were to take a survey here this morning and ask the question, how many of us love God? I believe we would probably get 100% of the vote that every one of us love God. But the question is this, what are we allowing God to do to change us into what he wants us to be? I love the Lord and God loves me, but God loves me too much to leave me in my sinful condition. God loves me too much to leave me in that circumstance and and God says, listen, I want you to know that I love you, but I love you too much to leave you there. And we find a man here who's unable to take for, care of himself, and God takes and uses four men to get him to a place where God can do something in his life that cannot be done by anyone else. Understand something. God wants to work in your heart and life. I said to you a moment ago that God loves you. God loves you too much to leave you there, but God wants to work in your life. And many of us would say, well, Pastor Brian, I'm doing okay. Look at my life. I mean, I have my health. Do you realize that just one phone call can change what you possess as far as your health? You say, I have my health. I have a job that I go to every week. I have a home that I live in. I have a wonderful marriage and things are going fine. And God has blessed me with a great church and I'm able to come and hear the word of God preached. Everything in my life seems to be exactly what it should be. But deep down within our hearts, 
while we're letting everyone see us tear the roof off and lower the sick of a palsy down, God sees our heart. Amen. God knows what's on the inside. Can I tell you, carnal Christians will produce carnal children. And carnal children will produce carnal grandchildren. Carnal Christians will produce a carnal church. And a carnal church will never accomplish anything for God. We've allowed so many things to consume our life, to consume ourself, to consume just, just to feed upon and to, 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 to just appeal to our pride. And we're busy and we allow everyone to see what's on the outside. We allow everyone to see what we want them to see. But I want you to understand something. Standing in the midst of the room this morning is a God that goes far beyond what you portray. He goes far beyond the actions that you're involved in. We serve a God this morning that peers directly into our heart. Amen. And knows who we are. And in spite of all that, God says, I love you. And I tell you, being loved is a wonderful thing. Aren't you glad that there are people that love you? The people that care for you. People that are there for you when you cannot do for yourself. I know many of us sometimes we look around at the generation that goes before us and I, we often look at things and we see things and, and, and we don't consider that one day we'll be in that same circumstance. My dad's mother, Miss Tanner, she had four sons. My dad was the oldest, had three brothers. She got older in life and was unable to care for herself. And those four boys took care of her. You know, we don't often think that in life, or we don't, we don't, it doesn't pass through our mind often that, you know, there might come a day when I can't take care of myself. And you'll be glad that there's someone that loves you. You'll be glad that there's someone that cares for you. My father-in-law has often said he has three daughters and one son. He said, I know my son's not going to take care of me, so I'm depending on those three girls to take care of me. And uh, he's made them all promise, listen, you won't put me away in a room somewhere and lock the door and throw away the key. You take care of me. You know, there's a God that wants to take care of us now. Amen. There's a God that sees our heart. And while we don't know it and while we don't understand it, Within us, there are things that are trying to do their dead level best to destroy us. You know that within the heart of man lies everything necessary to destroy his life? That when the, within the heart of every individual lies everything necessary for destruction in their life. You know, we often get so consumed and so concerned with everybody else and everything else. And God says, wait, the first concern needs to be your own heart. We get so concerned and consumed with all those things, but within our own heart lies everything necessary to destroy our life. You say, Pastor Mike, what do you mean? Every one of us are made of flesh. Right? Every one of us are made of flesh. And that flesh brings destruction. Every one of us can be filled with pride. And that pride brings destruction. You know when our pride is most dangerous? Not when we know more than our parents know, not when we know more than the preacher knows, but our pride becomes most dangerous in our life when we believe we know more than God knows. The Bible says here that God loves us. He loves us so much that He doesn't want to leave us there. And God wants to work in your heart this morning. Church has become, church has almost become, and sometimes if we're not careful, church can become almost like a, a beauty pageant. We'll put on our best and we'll do our best and we'll portray our best. All the while, our hearts are dirty and dark and we wonder why we struggle. We're trying to, we're trying to see the work of the Lord go forward. And do you, do you understand that just one, just one, can hinder the work of the Lord. Oh, Pastor Brian, one's not that important. Ask the nation of Israel when they went down to Ai if what one man had done affected an entire nation. 
God loves us so much, but He loves us too much to leave us there. God speaks to our hearts and God deals with our hearts and the work of the Lord is always a, a spiritual work. Understand, God is, not, God, is, God is concerned with what's on the outside and God wants to fix what's on the outside. But God knows and His Word teaches us that before the outside ever becomes what God desires for it to be, the inside must become what God desires for it to be. Amen. David's sin inspired him to pray, Create in me a clean heart, O God. The Bible says here we find this passage of Scripture in this story. I'm going to get right into the message. I can't stay too long where we are. We'll never get through where we need to be. The Bible says in Mark chapter number 2, that verse number 5, And when Jesus saw, I mentioned already that Jesus saw the hearts of men. But the Bible says here in this passage of Scripture in verse number 5, He says, When Jesus saw their faith. I said just a moment ago that God is going to use, or God often uses, different avenues, different tools, different people to help get us to where we need to be. Now the application of that in this story is very easy. Here's a man who could not get to the Lord. And there was four that came and got him and brought him to Christ. The world needs not another leader. The world doesn't need another idea. The world doesn't need another foundation. What our world needs is for Christians to stand and live like Christ. Amen. What our community needs is, is for Christians to stand and be the testimony that, that exemplifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I say that we need that more than just inside the walls of this church? Amen. We need this to be something that's done not just on Sunday morning at Bethel Baptist Church and at Sunday morning at this church and Sunday morning at this church. What we must have, friend, is Christians who understand the need to be Christ-like not only on Sunday morning and Sunday night or on Wednesday night, but on Monday and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. And when we're out with our friends and when we're hanging with our neighbors, friend, we need people who understand the importance of God doing a work in people's heart that man cannot do in our job is to simply get those people to God. Get them to Christ. Who is God? Who, who is God? Or how is God going to use you to get someone to the Lord? Say, Pastor, I want to be used of God. I want to be used of the Lord. If I were to ask that question this morning, again, I believe we would probably get 100% of the vote if we asked the question, I, I, how many of you want God to use you? I believe every one of us would raise our hand. Say, I want God to use me. Can I tell you, not everybody can be the preacher. Right? Not everybody can lead the music. Not everybody can play the piano. And not everybody can teach the class. But everybody can do something for God. And what God has given you to do is just as important as what God has given someone else to do. Let me say that again. What God has given you to do is just as important as what God has given someone else to do. Amen. You say, well, Pastor Brian, I'm not certain about that. I think what you do on Sunday morning is way more important than I do. That's exactly the problem. Right. You see, we're concerned about what people see rather than what God knows. That's right. That's right. We're concerned about what people see rather than what God knows. And when we look at the Bible, we understand something. That while man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Pastor, what you do is more important. No, no, no. In the eyes of the Lord, every one of us are accountable to God. Amen. And God knows your heart. God sees your heart. What is God going to use you to do? So I want God to use me. I want the Lord to use me. I think there's four great examples in this passage that we read about that every one of us can learn something from. You know the great thing about it is not one of their names are given. They don't say, now this is brother so-and-so, he's the leader of this group, and, and he's, the, he's the preacher down here at this church, or he works in this ministry. God doesn't even give their name. Amen. Here's the point. The goal of the Christian life is always to give the glory to God. Amen. Never to keep any of it for ourselves. Jesus said... That I'll take care. Th those disciples said, Lord, who's going to sit beside you in heaven? 
They were concerned about what everybody saw. But what did Jesus do? He looked at the heart. There's four men here. They're not even named. Many of us would have a problem with that. Now, if I'm going to serve here, I need to... I've heard people say now. Now, if I'm going to serve, I need people to know that I'm in charge. Can I tell you that there's one person in charge at Bethel Baptist Church. It's God. Everybody else's name doesn't matter. If you look around our property here on purpose, they've started putting it on the bulletin, but on our tracks, they've, they've put it on our tracks recently. When I first came here, I said, my name doesn't need to be on there. They made this new sign. They said, Pastor, we want to make sure your name's on there. I said, don't put the name on there. Why? Because my name's unimportant. The glory doesn't belong to a man. It belongs to God. But here are four men who are, who are bringing people to Jesus. They're bringing people to Jesus and they're unnamed. And we take these four men and we look at their life and God says, here's what you can learn about getting people with a heart problem to God. I want God to use me. Well, if you want God to use you, it won't happen by accident. There are a couple of things I want to point out before I get into the message this morning where the Bible says in verse number 1 of chapter 2, are you there? Good. Look what the Bible says. And again, he entered into Capernaum. And after some days, it was noise that he was in the house. Listen to me. Anytime you exalt the Lord or lift up Christ or stand for truth or preach the word of God, it is going to create a stir. It's the time that we don't disturb the present that we should be most concerned. Because then the question is this. If we're not disturbing the present, if there's not a stir, then what are we preaching? What's the message? Every once in a while you come to church and you're going to get offended when the Bible's preached. Every once in a while, you're going to come to church or you're going to open your Bible and you're not going to like what is said or what you read. It's going to conflict with your inside. It's going to conflict with your heart. Listen, no preacher that gets up that's worth his salt that desires to be obedient to the Lord gets up with the purpose of making people mad. But Jesus made people mad. As a matter of fact, there's a crowd sitting in here listening to him and their purpose of listening to him is to see him mess up. They weren't there to see what he, had, he could do. They wanted to catch him. And so I go to church. You know, sometimes we don't go to church with the right heart, do we? Sometimes we go to church and we think, well, I'm not getting anything. And the reason we're not getting anything is not because there's nothing being said. It's that we don't want to receive what's being given. The Bible says there, there was noise that Jesus was in the house. Verse number 2. And straightway, look what the Bible says. And straightway. You know what that word straightway means? It means immediately. Immediately, the Bible says in verse number 2, many were gathered together. Now, I'm going to stop and kick this bucket for a little while. But help me, okay? When, when God is doing something, God's people are to be involved in it. When there's something going on in the house of God, you ought to be here. When there's something going on in your ministry, you ought to be serving in it. And every part of it, when God is being lifted up, God's people ought to want to be there. The Bible says immediately they were gathered together. Insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And here's what he did. Here, the Bible says Jesus had a crowd so much they were standing outside the door. They couldn't even get in the room. And here's what Jesus was doing. And he preached the word unto them. Listen, he didn't give them a self-help lesson. He didn't pet them and tell them to do the very best they could. He preached the word unto them. The culture we live in doesn't like the truth. As a matter of fact, I heard one of our nominees for president make a statement recently he said we don't deal with truth we deal with facts <laughs> I'm, uh, he, I, I'm, that's, but, but that's the, the culture we live in 
Don't tell me what I need to hear. Tell me what I want to hear. The truth is relative, Pastor, not according to the Word of God. The Bible says he preached the Word unto them. So here's Jesus. I mean, he's in a sold-out capacity crowd. And the Bible says he's preaching the Word unto them. Can I tell you, church, let me just remind us for a little bit. Don't ever substitute the preaching of God's Word for anything. You say, well, Pastor Brian, I, God, you know, we, we are being moved. Uh, the military is moving us. Our job is transferring us and all this kind of good stuff. Listen to me. You find a church where the Bible's preached. You find a church where the truth is preached. Don't you settle for some watered down, washed out, no power, no, no conviction. Just, just you, you know, let me just get approval from everybody before I say anything. You find a preacher that will open the word of God and preach the truth, preach the word of God, because that is what helps the souls Amen. of men. The Bible says he's preaching to them. And if preaching was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for us. Amen. But in the midst of all that, Aren't you glad that while Jesus is working here, he's working in other places? Bethel Baptist Church doesn't have a monopoly on God. But God should have a monopoly on Bethel Baptist Church. There are four men who have a friend. The Bible says that these men understand that Jesus is in the house just like everybody else did. And somewhere along the way, these, these, these four men knew what Christ could do. And while they knew there was a meeting going on down in Capernaum, the Bible says their thoughts went to their friend who was stuck on a couch and could not get there himself. And the Bible says they left. They went and got him. He said, I want God to use me to help get people to Jesus. There are people in our church. They're working to get folks in church to hear the gospel so that Christ can change their life. There are people who are inviting folks. Everywhere Brother David goes, he invites people to church. I go into places and they ask me that. I know a guy that goes down to your church. Usually it's in public somewhere. And he'll say, he rides around here on a scooter sometimes. Passes out tracks inviting people to church. Amen. I was in a place the other day and found one of our tracks in the restroom. There are people who are working to get people to Christ. Can I tell you, don't stop doing that. Don't think that that's outdated or that doesn't work anymore or that's unimportant. Hey, you keep being a witness. You keep sharing the gospel. You Amen. keep planting the seed and God will cause it to grow. Amen. The Bible says these four men went back and they, they got their friend and they brought him to the Lord. What can I do? How can God use me? If God is going to use you, I'm going to give you three things this morning in this passage that we see that have to be present if God's going to use us. How many are married? Would you raise your hand? How many want God to use your marriage? How many hope to be married one day? Let me ask that question. Very good. How many have children? Would you raise your hand? How many want God to use your children? By the way, you say, well, I don't know if God can ever use my children. Stop for just a moment. Remember the book of Jonah? That God sent Jonah to preach that great revival to Nineveh. And the Bible says that Jonah went to Nineveh to preach that revival. And here's what he said. Repent, for in 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown. His message to them was repent. Do you understand that just a few days before that it was Jonah that had to repent? That it was Jonah that had to get right with God? God can use anybody that will give their life to him. See, I have kids, I want to be, how many of you want God to use your church? Amen. I want God to use, well, these things have to be present if God's going to use us. You say, well, Pastor Brian, what needs to be done is far beyond the normal. Can I tell you that God always works outside the realm of average and expected? He always works in the supernatural realm. He always works in the miraculous room. These things have to be present if we're going to see God use us. And I'm talking about more than just a church. I'm talking about a Christian who's concerned with what everybody else sees that should be concerned with what God sees in his heart. Amen. These have to be present. Number one, I want you to write them down if you would, please. Look what the Bible says. Look in verse number three. And there came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. He's speaking of these four men, this one that was sick, the, the one that was sick that, 
that was unable to move, sick of the palsy, the Bible says, the Bible says that there were four that brought him unto him. Now, why did they bring him here? Verse number one. And it was noised that he who, Jesus, was in the house. Look at verse number two. And straightway many were gathered together, and so much there was no room to receive him, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. The first thing that I want you to get, I want you to remember, I want you to write down, please. If you are going to be used of God, there must be a Christ-focused vision present. A Christ-focused vision. Many today, or many who live in our world today, are more concerned with how they're perceived rather than how God is perceived through them. We're more concerned, and many churches move in that direction as well. We get more concerned about how men view us and what men want and what people want rather than what God wants. You see, the Christian life is designed to be successful in one way. It is designed to be lived through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is designed to be lived successfully. It cannot be lived successfully without God's help. These men understood that it was only Christ that could make a difference in their life. It was only Christ that could make a difference in this man's life. It was only Christ that could do what must be done. Their recognition of Christ, write this down please, their recognition of Christ produced in them a desire to serve. Somewhere along the way, they learned, they understood, they knew what Christ could do. And because they knew what God had done for them, there was a desire in their heart to get somebody else to Christ. Do you know why people don't witness? Well, they're afraid. Oh, they don't know what to say. Oh, they don't have time. Those are all wonderful things. But my question is this. I wonder, has Christ ever really done anything for you? I wonder if he's done anything for you. You say, well, I go to church. I didn't ask you if you go to church. Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? Have you ever been born again? Do you know what it means to call Jesus Christ your Savior, your Heavenly Father? Do you understand that you were lost in your trespasses and sin and that without Christ there was no hope? But one day you understood when Christ came by where you were that without Him you were going to die and go to hell and you placed your faith and trust in Him. That, my friend, is what you must know about God. And if you know that about God, you'll want others to know that about God. Somewhere along the way, these four men met Jesus. God had done something in their life, and they thought about their friend laying on a couch, and they said, if we can get him to Christ, Christ can change everything. You see, church is not about, while we enjoy wonderful preaching, it's not about the preacher. While we enjoy wonderful music, church is not about music. And while we enjoy the fellowship, it is not about the fellowship. If Bethel Baptist Church is going to remain effective in your home and in your life and in our community, friend, it is simply because Christ is the center of all that is done. They had a Christ-focused vision. They'd heard that Jesus was in the house, that he was preaching the word, and they said, hey, we got to get our friend to Jesus. It's hard to bring your friend to Jesus when you're not willing to come to him. Help me now. We oftentimes neglect our, our responsibility as a Christian because of the carnality that's in our own life. Christians, help me out, please. You don't just represent Christ on Sunday. You just don't represent Christ during the revival meeting. You just don't represent Christ, church Estra, when you're sitting up here in a horse shape, in this horse, horseshoe, there we go, horse shape, not horse shape. That'd be a unique orchestra set up, wouldn't it, Brother Williams? Horseshoe, amen? Y'all get up here and speak sometime. You'll say something that don't come out the right way. And I'm going to laugh at all of y'all, too. You, you don't just represent Christ when you sing in that choir. You don't represent Christ just when you sing in that choir. You represent Christ on your job. You represent Christ with your friends. You represent Christ in your home. You represent Christ on your social media. People see what they see about you and you represent Christ. And if that vision isn't flowing through the Lord, if that, if that life isn't lived through the purpose that God has given it, friend, then we're living it for something that is not worth it. 
They said, Jesus is here. We must get him to Christ. What Christ had done in their life produced a desire to get other people to Christ. Number two, there must be a Christ-focused vision. Number two, write this one down. If God is going to use this, number two, there must be the courage to overcome obstacles. Don't think for one moment if you give your life to Christ that the devil is just going to let you waltz right into God's will. Church, don't think for one moment when we say, God, this place belongs to you and we want it to be something that you use for your honor and glory. Don't think for one moment that the devil's not going to try to destroy it. Look what the Bible says in the passage here. Everybody still with me? Look what the Bible says. Verse number four. And when they could not come nigh to him. We have people who drive into our church and drive onto our property on Sunday mornings and there's a few spots available out there today, but some Sundays there's not a parking spot available. Sometimes they're parking on the sides of the road and they're parking in different places and behind the building and there's not a piece of uh, a parking spot available and they'll pull in, they'll see that it's full and they'll drive in in this side, drive right out that side and leave. The Bible says these four men came to this home and the Bible says that while Jesus was preaching, they came to the place where they could not get in. And I tell you, many Christians, the first obstacle that stands in our way, we turn tail and run. Amen. The first time that anything stands against us, we cower and allow the devil to have the victory. Look in, would you be pleased in verse number 4, and they could not come nigh unto him. For the press, friend, they didn't stop there, did they? I don't know whose house they were in, but these boys weren't worried about it, were they? The Bible says they couldn't get to Jesus, so they climbed on the roof. Now, I want you to think about it for just a moment. They'd already borne him from where he was. Born him, I mean, they carried him from where he was to where the meeting was taking place. Hey, friend, you ought to be where the meeting's taking place. They had already gotten him from where he was. Brother Andy, where's Brother Andy at? Brother Andy said, Pastor, I need some help. Brother Donnie and Brother Craig and myself went over and helped Brother Andy. You move a large piece of furniture. I mean large. Large. <laughs> Man, we, t we got over there. We had to figure out how to get it out of the door. There's all kinds of things you get to do as a pastor. Man, they had they had furniture moving class in Bible seminary. Amen. I said to Brother Donnie all the way over there, I said, Brother, when did they teach us this part? We're going over, man, we had to figure out how to get the door. We had to take parts of the door off. We had to get it in the back of the truck. We had to move to where we had to dodge rattlesnakes. <laughs> Amen. In the midst of all this, while we're holding this piece of large furniture, Brother Andy said, Man, I saw a big timber rattler over there the other day. Man, I wanted to drop the furniture and just walk <laughs> off, man. I said, the devil was a serpent. I don't need to be around this place. Hey, get it in there. Hey, get it over where it needs to be. Get it out. Set it up. Make sure it was good to go. They had already gone in his house, taken the doors off the hinges, uh, unscrewed the bottoms of the couch legs so it fit through the door, turned it up sideways with him on it. They had, to, they had to ratchet strap him down so he didn't fall out and get him out the door to get him just to where Jesus was. Many of us would have said, look at everything that I've done. Isn't this enough? The Bible says, though, that they did not stop there. They carried him from where he was to Jesus. And the Bible says he could not get in. They said, we're getting him in there. Amen. So they climbed up on the roof. So now not only did they have to finagle him out the door, carry him from where he was, but they had to get on a roof and, number one, tear a hole in the roof big enough to get him down to Jesus. Amen. Then they had to pull him up on the roof. Can you imagine that? I remember one time when my dad first started pastoring, he was working putting satellites on top of Revco's. Anybody remember what Revco's were? How many of you never heard of a Revco in your life? A Revco was where Walgreens began, all right? Revco had their own radio station. Satellite radio, before satellite radio was cool, my daddy was doing it. He took me to work with him. I was probably, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, something like that. I might have been 3, 4, 5, I can't remember. And uh, I remember I went to work with him. And uh, he had to install these satellites on top of Revco. Well, the only way to keep the satellite on top of Revco was to put cinder blocks on the frame. And it took 14 cinder blocks. 
Daddy said, son, I'm going to get up here and put this frame together and set this satellite up. He said, you got one job. You guessed it. Your job is to get the 14 cinder blocks on the roof. Man, I tried every way. I remember we had an old Coca-Cola crate, and I could put two of them in there. And I could set the Coca-Cola crate on the ladder, tie a rope to it, climb up, put the cinder blocks in the, in the crate, and pull it up the ladder. The problem was I wasn't really strong enough to reach out to where the ladder was without falling off the roof. <laughs> Daddy, he wasn't too worried about OSHA requirements. He said, just get him up here, son. <laughs> man, I had to haul up 14 cinder blocks. Here they are hauling this man up the roof. Still no excuse. Why? Because they knew what Jesus could do to him. They get him on the roof and they're like, man, we got to get him in there. So they commence to tearing the roof open. Can you imagine the homeowner? <laughs> Honey, who do we have our insurance through? <laughs> Speed dial, call him now. And they lowered him down. And look at this, please. Look what the Bible says. One of the most unique statements in all of Scripture. Look at it, please, in verse number 5. And when Jesus saw their faith what about wait the man that was in the bed sick his faith no when Jesus saw their faith here's what he said thy sins be forgiven you when Jesus saw their commitment to overcome an obstacle and I tell you marriage takes work you gonna have some obstacles serving God takes work you're gonna have some obstacles trying to be the right kind of person, has some obstacles. And if you quit every time, every time that old snake sticks his head out the hole, you're going to do nothing but quit all your life. You have to be willing to overcome some obstacles. I want to tell you why we're not willing. I, mean, I don't have any money in the stock market. But in the late 2000s, when the stock market crashed, I had a man tell me personally, he said, I lost $100,000 in one day. Now, $100,000 may not be a lot of money to you. $100,000 is a lot of money. He said, I lost $100,000 in one day. There were people opening their office windows and jumping out because they lost so much money. You know why it didn't bother me? Because I didn't have anything invested in it. It didn't matter to me if the stock market crashed, blew up, or gained. It didn't affect me. You know why we're so easy to quit when the obstacles come? Because we've never picked up a corner of a bed and carried it. We don't have anything invested. You know why church is a take it or leave it thing to some of you? You don't have anything invested. I'm preaching now. You see, if you had something invested in it, it'd be important to you what's going on. It would matter to you what had taken place. We let everything in the world become, and we'll invest in everything else in the world. But investing in God's works like going to the dentist office for some people. You know why these men weren't going to let the fact that there was a big crowd where Jesus was keep them from getting their friend to Christ? Because they already had something invested. Well, we already carried him all the way down here. We already brought him this far. We're not going to let just a few people keep us from getting to where Jesus Amen. is. We're not just going to let, a, let a, few, a few dollars keep us from where God wants us. We're going to let just a few, a few struggles and a few trials and a few hiccups in the road keep us from what God wants to do, are we? You won't if you have something invested. It'll matter to you. You see, it mattered to these men. You know why? Because they carried the corner of a bed. They had borne him, Brother Elmer. They had taken their might, their sweat, their blood when he could not do for himself. And they did for him. They invested not their money, but their life. Amen. There was a willingness to overcome an obstacle. Can I tell you that God always has a solution when Satan presents a struggle? Can I say that again? Some of you are trying to figure out how you're going to, how you're going to make it through tomorrow. Some of you are going to try to, you're trying to figure out how your marriage is going to last another six months. How I'm going to get this taken care of. Hey friend, God always has the solution when a struggle is present. But you've got to have something invested. 
You've got to have something given. You're not going to get anything from God until you're willing to give your life to Him. Amen. The Bible says there was a willingness to overcome an obstacle. Last and we'll be done. Look in verse number 6. Or verse number 5. And then they saw their faith. He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Verse 6, is in six 7, and 8 is Jesus rebuking those who were sitting there for the wrong purpose. Verse number 9, verse number 10 says, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took the bed and went forth before them all. Insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. It's recorded there as much like we would expect Jesus worked a wonderful miracle. The third thing that must be present in your heart if God is going to use you is there has to be a contentment with God's plan. Amen. You know, the Bible says about the Lord Jesus Christ that if everything was written uh, that could be written about the Lord, that the earth could not contain it. Right. Now, I want you to think about the relationship to what we know about God and what the Bible says we don't know about God. If all that was written about the Lord, if we were, had written everything that could be written about the Lord, the Bible says the earth could not contain it. Think about that for just a moment. If all that could be written about the Lord was written, the earth could not contain the volumes. Yet what we have about the Lord is represented in this book. But God said if everything that was written about the Lord was written, the earth could not contain it. There's a lot more that we don't know about God than what we do know about God. Amen. Can I say this to you? As a matter of fact, you even find this in Scripture. There were some times Jesus didn't work the way it was expected for Him to work. There were some times that Jesus let Lazarus die and then raised him from the dead. But Martha said, had you been here, my brother would not have died. But had Lazarus not died, they would not have seen the power of God. There are certain times, and they're not all recorded for us. God knows. There were times that people came to those meetings, the multitudes came, and they brought sick, and Jesus didn't heal them. There were some times that people came, and they had a problem. They needed something. They needed God to provide. And there were times when people were hungry, and they had heard how Jesus fed the 5,000. They showed up, and Jesus didn't get to them. You still with me? There's sometimes you want God to do for you what you think God needs to do, and God doesn't do what you think He should do, and God is still right. Can you imagine for just a moment these four men bringing this, this man to Jesus? They broke through the crowd, got on the roof, went and got him, broke through the crowd, got on the roof. And listen, he was a, the Bible says he was a man because Jesus called him man, and he was sick, so you know he was complaining the whole time they were carrying him to wherever they needed to go. I mean, you have a husband that gets sick? I mean, your husbands, when they get sick, they think they're going to die. Amen. I know sometimes I'll get sick and I'll go, baby, this is the end. I don't think I'm going to ever breathe again. Right? You know he was complaining the whole time. Guys, could y'all take it easy? I'm sick, man. I'm handicapped. I'm crippled. T take it easy on the road. You know he was complaining. Getting him up on the roof, man, complaining the whole time. I'm sure he was. He was a man. Can you imagine had they done all that? Tore the roof off and began to lower him down and Jesus walked out the door. We say, I'm only going to serve God and I'm only going to be used of God when God does what I want him to do. God's not your puppet. God doesn't do it the way you want it to be done all the time. God doesn't meet the need the way we think it needs to be met all the time. God doesn't do it the way we think it should be done because He promised us in His Word His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God says, if you're going to let me use you, then you have to be content with what I want to use you for. Amen. Now, God, I'll serve you if. Now, God, I can be faithful if. God says, no, no. If you're going to want me to use you, 
then you have to be okay with how I want to use you. There are a lot of people in the Bible I wish I could be. Amen? Can you imagine being Noah? Hey, there's no film crew that can do justice to what God did when he flooded the earth. Most men would be pretty good at being Noah. Why? Because in the end, Noah was right. You're always right. Man, I'll be honest with you. I would be afraid, but it would have been cool to be Daniel. I mean, here comes the lion. I mean, that lion's coming through the den. And God says, and the lion, I mean, his bulldog right in front of Daniel. And all he can do is stand there and look at him. The Bible says that God didn't kill the lions or hurt the lions. He just shut their mouth. I mean, that's, that's torture. I mean, that's like having ice cream in the refrigerator and your wife telling you you can't have any. I mean, you just pace in front of the refrigerator, waiting for some maybe to fall out act like you were cleaning it up, you know. God's, hey, just shut the lion's mouth. Here's Daniel standing there. Not afraid. I would have loved him in Daniel. Can I tell you, though? I wouldn't have wanted to have been Job. Can I tell you, I, I wouldn't have wanted to have been, while he did a great work for the Lord, I'll be honest with you, I don't think it would have been much fun for me to be the Apostle Paul. Amen. Left for dead. Be thrown outside the city, stoned. A day and a night to see, just floating around, hoping somebody comes by and picks him up. I don't want to volunteer for that. But if we're going to let God use us, we have to be okay with what God wants to use us for. Amen. You know what these men did? They didn't let the fact that Jesus hadn't healed some and that Jesus had not provided for others like he had provided for some keep them from doing what he wanted them to do. You see, here's the, here's the thing you must remember, friends. The results always belong to God. One of the greatest things that I'm learning and one of the greatest things that I've started to learn and I've tried to learn and, and become better at it is that while I want Bethel Baptist Church to be everything God wants it to be, what it becomes belongs to God. The results are left to God. And sure, God might bless and God might provide and God might do a wonderful work and it might be what we would consider or label an easy work, friend. It might be something that goes with no bumps or bruises or no issues, but it might be something that crumbles to the ground because the results are left to God. It might be something that falls apart it might be something that has to be rebuilt and redone and, 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 and start over. It may be that. Why? Because the results belong to God. I'm just content to be used with however God wants to use me. Amen. But if I start placing stipulations on God, God says, no, I can't use someone who has to be in control. One point and I'll be done. Those three things have to be present. There has to be, number one, a Christ-focused vision. A courage to overcome obstacles and a commitment to God's plan. One word I want you to circle. One word I want you to circle. Verse number five. The Bible says in verse number five, I want you to circle the very first word. What is it? When. You know what, you know what when carries with it? It carries a moment of time when. And here's what I want you to see. The Bible says that when Jesus saw their faith. In other words, this. God says there's a moment. There's a moment of decision. There's a moment that you're going to make a choice with your life. I heard a preacher say this just recently. He said, there are, there are moments in our life where something must be done. He said, there are moments in our life where something must be done. And if they are not done in that moment, 
they will forever remain undone. There are moments. The Bible says that these four men bore this man to Christ. They brought him to Christ and they lowered him down. And the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus not only physically healed him, but he spiritually healed him. He said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. There are moments when we must make a decision in our life. Or forever that decision will remain undone. There are moments. There are times when you're going to hear the la- There are moments when you're going to hear the last sermon preached. There are moments when God is going to speak to your heart for the last time. There are moments when you must make a decision. And if that decision is not made, it will forever remain undone. The Bible says when he saw their faith, thy sins be forgiven thee. I want to be used of God. See, I want want to be used of God. When? When you got everything put together and in order in your life? When? That moment of decision. Lord, I thank you this morning for the word of God that is true. I thank you for speaking to us and helping us. I thank you for speaking to me.